Welcome back to the 112th episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including AI's power of persuasion, how the fourth estate is no longer doing its job in keeping the government liable, and a new bill that's passing in New York that creates another protected class. And, of course, we will end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive, ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling for me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. So, how susceptible to persuasion are you? You know, I'm not trying to be cute, but we live in an age where we are constantly bombarded with different types of information on social media, on the news, from different newspapers. And I want to know how much you think really sinks in. And are you worried about AI being able to subtly or slightly change your or tweak your ideas or positions on important issues? Because that's what our first article is going to really discuss here. So tell me what you think down in the comment section. I'd love to hear what you have to say. So like I just talked about, our first article comes from the Wall Street Journal. Help! My political beliefs were altered by a chatbot. And this has been a subtle concern, or at least I've heard it discussed a few different times from many prominent people in the social media sphere, in the political sphere, but also from people who are actively working on AI. I believe it's Sam Altman, the owner, or sorry, the head of ChatGPT talked about the very subtle powers that AI could have. And that's why they have to make sure that when they're making ChatGPT and putting it out into the public, that has to be aligned very, very well. Meaning that it's not just giving random responses, it's giving calculated responses that actually output information in a way that one, people will understand, but two, is somewhere in the middle rather than being on the left or the right. And this is something they had a big issue with with the original release of ChatGPT. It would sometimes give answers that were a little bit biased. And they tried to hone it in for GPT-4, and some people said that it's a little bit less biased in some areas, and some people didn't necessarily agree with that, saying there are still underlying biases. But there's an active debate going on about making sure that AI is done the right way because it does have this power, or at least a lot of people claim it has this power to subtly change the way you think about certain issues. And it's not just claims. There are also studies backing this up, and that's why this article was written, because there's a new study that got released. Quote, a growing body of research shows that they can also change our thinking without our knowing. One of the latest studies in this vein from researchers spread across the globe found that when subjects were asked about using AI to help them write an essay, an AI could nudge them to write an essay either for or against a particular view, depending on the bias of the algorithm. Performing an exercise also measurably influenced the subject's opinion on the topic after the exercise. Quote, you may not even know that you're being influenced, says Moore Naman, a professor in information science department at Cornell University and the senior author of the paper. He calls this phenomena latent persuasion, end quote. So that's a really, really scary, in my opinion, scary. Then again, okay, so well, I'll explain why I think it's scary, and then I'll talk about why maybe it's not as scary as I'm making it sound. So if you are arguing on one side of the aisle and the chatbot that you're using has a little bit of a bias from the other side of the aisle, let's say, and it slowly nudges you and works you and you're trying to write a really persuasive essay and it throws in a few quotes here and it throws in a little bit of information from a different source that you weren't thinking of and maybe it slightly changes the way you think about something. Because, you know, writing an essay is a process by which we evolve. I actually had a great conversation with my girlfriend last night talking about this. I went into writing one of my final essays for philosophy with a very particular point of view. And as I was writing, I was like, okay, wow, this this logical system, the way that I'm laying this out, this doesn't actually make sense to prove my point. 
it actually proves almost the opposite. So I had to step back and say, okay, well, I still agree with my points. I think that this holds logically, but I think I'm going to have to alter my conclusion. And that is the process of thinking. Sometimes that is how we go about it. We're writing. We are talking, even. And different thoughts pop into our head. We notice where our logic is taking us, and we understand, oh, no, our preconceived notion, our preconceived idea of how this should end, actually, that doesn't seem to hold up. So if the AI is kind of infusing different information in a very subtle way, then it can alter the way you think about certain issues. I feel like that isn't that far out of the realm of possibility. And the thing is, if it does it in a subtle way, just presenting that information, allowing you to use it rather than in a heavy hand way, saying, no, I can't give you this type of information because it is wrong. If it does it like that, then people aren't, they're going to be like, whoa, 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 AI, AI, I want you on my side here. I don't want you telling me that I can't have this point or this point is wrong, okay? Get out of here. But if it prevents, like I said, if it presents new information in a unique way, that novelty may make it easier for you to truly accept what it's saying. So you can see the power that it has here and why this could be very dangerous. Why it's not so dangerous. If you're using AI as a tool to write, either one, you are a person who is easily persuadable and or you're a person that's lazy. I'm not trying to be mean, but some people will use it as a means to just, oh, yeah, no, I need an essay. It's due at 12 o'clock. Hey, chat GPT, write it up. I'll go through and edit some things. And they don't really care. So it doesn't matter. It's not like they're that loyal to their belief. So why does it necessarily matter? They're just doing it to get the grade or just to get the point across or show that they got something written down. And then the other person that is likely to use it is someone who's experimenting but also needs a little bit of help constructing something, pulling up different data from different sources they may not have looked into. And they may already have a very strong belief and already understand the opposition that would be brought up to their position, and they can push back against the chatbot and actually not be susceptible to its subtle influences. Now, that doesn't always hold true. Just because you know a topic well it doesn't mean you're the smartest on it. It doesn't mean you're not willing to change your opinion. But, you know, there is an argument there that they wouldn't necessarily be as easy to persuade and as susceptible to that novel information that I was talking about. All right, so let's go to another quote from this article that highlights that there are a few different results from this study that may be intriguing to some people. Quote, the topic that subjects were moved to change their minds about was whether or not social media was good for society. Dr. Naman and his colleagues picked the topic in part because it's not an issue about which people tend to have deeply held beliefs, which would be harder to change. And let's just pause right there. When I first read that, I was like, no, that's that's not true. And when I say that's not true, I don't mean that's not true for the wider population. A lot of people probably don't actively think about how social media affects our society. And if they do, they may not be as strongly in one camp or another. And they may be willing to hear other types of information. But when I read that, I said, that's not true. I I don't I think I would still be influenced. I'm not saying that I wouldn't be influenced by the AI, but I definitely have very strong beliefs about whether social media is good or bad for our society. Quote, an AI primed to be biased in favor of social media tended to guide subjects to write essays that according to that bias. And the opposite happened when the AI was primed to be negative against social media. Potential negative uses of this feature of generative AI abound. Autocratic governments could mandate that social media and productivity tools all nudge their citizens to communicate in a certain way. Even, absent all ill intent, students might be unconsciously nudged to adopt certain views when using AIs to help them learn. End quote. And, you know, this is probably my overly, I don't want to say overly paranoid, but the part of me that distrusts big government, that distrusts big organizations, there is a part of me that doesn't necessarily like authority. Let's put it that way. And when you hear something like this, my mind begins to spin a little bit. The way that we could be subtly influenced, especially with the presence of AI 
almost everywhere in every single search engine I have. And you may be saying, well, every single search engine. Yes, I, I have Google Chrome. I have DuckDuckGo as well as Brave, the browser and the search engine. Just because one, it allows me to get sources of information from different places, but two, they have different privacy policies. And three, I don't necessarily want to give Google all my traffic and all my data. Now, you know, at the end of the day, it's probably getting sold to them. Either way, I understand. But it's kind of more of a tiny bit of protest. But in all of those search engines, there is an AI tool that presents information. And some are better than others with sources. And they even highlight where they grab certain things from. But imagine in the future when these technologies are so refined and people don't, they trust them so much that they don't go beyond the chatbot. They'll look and they'll say, oh, okay, this little summary, this is nice. Oh, and it tells me where it's from. And they just look at that to get their information rather than continuing and going on a, a deeper dive, so to speak. So imagine if that's the case and government says, you know, we need you to nudge people on this very particular issue when it comes to giving up their rights. We need to make sure there's a, a justification and we need to make sure that that summary talks about how the government makes sure that they have a safe and secure society and we make sure that some of the risk isn't passed on to the citizens, whatever their argument may be. So just imagine that. I'm not trying to be extremely negative. I'm not trying to be doomsaying. Just actually sit down and think about that and think about whether you would want that in your society. Some people wouldn't mind. Some people are okay with the government intervening in order to provide safety and security because to some degree that is part of their mandate, but other people are not. So you need to sit down and have a thought process or at least give it some genuine thought rather than just a peripheral glance like, oh, yeah, that may be scary and see where you stand on it. I'm not saying that you'll be able to do anything. I'm not saying that you'll be able to change the world just because you sat down and thought about it and made sure that you came down on one particular side or the other. But make sure you know where you stand in case this becomes a major issue later on, because I think it will. Government is almost always behind technology, especially when it emerges. We still haven't properly regulated Bitcoin or Ethereum. I'm not saying we should, but they definitely want to, and they still haven't done it properly yet. So it will be a while before AI law comes in. But... When that happens, you should probably know where you stand because this will probably be a huge regulation and legislative battle for our generation, if I'm being honest. All right. So in the article tries to close it off in a really nice way and really summarize everything and how it could be used in an ideal way. And I think there is a little bit of substance here, and I think there is a good point, but I also think it alludes to something a little bit more sinister. Quote, Once people are equipped with information about the biases of the AI they are using, they might decide on that bias on which they should use and in what context, says Linda Chilton, a professor of computer science at Columbia University. Doing so could return a sense of agency to people about using AIs to help them create content or help them communicate and help them avoid any sense of threat from latent persuasion, she adds. It's also possible that people will find that they can consciously use the power of AI to nudge themselves towards expressing different points of view and styles of communication. An AI program to make our communications more positive and empathetic could go a long way towards helping us connect online, for example, end quote. And they're talking about the idea here that there will be conservative AIs, there will be liberal AIs, and if you really want to nudge yourself or you want to understand the other side's position, you go to the Democrat AI or you go to the conservative AI and you say, tell me about this issue. And it gives you a breadth of information about the current topics and it gives quotations, it cites different authors and it makes sure to weave in different quotes that may illustrate the point very, very well, which I think there is some utility to that because very often when you're sitting across from somebody and they're coming at you, they have that hostile face, or even if they're just a little bit combative, it can be hard for you to actually hear them. It's kind of human nature. It's also a little bit of ego in some cases. It's hard for you to actually listen and remove yourself from the conversation. And what I mean by that is take your ego out of it and make sure that you actually understand what they're saying rather than just trying to win the argument. So if it comes from an AI, 
maybe it's a little bit easier to take in that information and hear the other side. Because while you may not agree, at least understanding the arguments of the other side is very valuable. Not only one, to deconstruct it and actually be able to push back against it, but also to, like they kind of said here at the end, be a little bit empathetic to the logic that they're using and the worldview that they have. Because going forward, maybe you could utilize that same worldview or that same empathy or the same talking points in a way that helps construct your argument and makes it even stronger. And also the last part where maybe we could have communication that's a little bit more positive and empathetic. The example they use here is the auto suggestions in Gmail. If you notice, none of them are ever mean. Even if you would probably respond in a negative way to an email that's a little bit hostile, they're never negative. They're always positive. They're always trying to reinforce a nice, very formal, very kind way of communicating. And maybe in the future, we could use that because I feel like a lot of our communication online and even in person can be hostile sometimes. I don't think I'd run into that as much in person, but it still happens. So maybe these AIs could help us learn new ways to communicate. Sure. But also remember, when you're actively doing that, they could be nudging you in a way that's not necessarily beneficial or isn't exactly how you would want to express yourself. And maybe if you're learning from a government-trained AI, they might nudge you to believe certain things on a subconscious level. That is my really paranoid and really out there side saying that. But it's a possibility. And you should just be aware of it. If you use these tools to help yourself, make sure you don't get too caught up in it. And let's be clear, like I said, there's value. There is value to all of these tools, but when used right and when used in moderation, because you don't want to become too disconnected from what makes you you, and you don't want to be too conditioned by an AI. But maybe some people do. Maybe I'm just crazy. Who, who knows? But I know that this next story definitely had me feeling a little bit crazy when I first read it, and it comes from the American Institute for Economic Research how the media became the Pentagon's plumbers. And I think they're trying to really, really pull on the fact that the new show, The Plumbers, is coming out on HBO, and it was about <laughs> the Watergate incident and how Nixon had his fixers, so to speak. So I think they're playing on that a little bit. But they're probably going to release this article anyway and just call it something different. So how has this really come to be? How have the press come to defend the government's major decisions, and how is this really contrasting from the past? So let's first discuss what's happening now. Quote, I just deleted a tweet that lacked nuance. The two-time Pulitzer Prize winner wrote, Phillips, who in 2022 received the top award in journalism for his reporting on previous undisclosed U.S. military strikes that killed thousands of civilians in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, was walking back an observation made following the arrest of 21-year-old Jack Texera, the Massachusetts Air National Guardsman accused of leaking state secrets. Phillips noted the Times had worked feverishly to assist the Pentagon in identifying Texera. Quote, ironically, if the same guy leaked to the New York Times, we'd be working feverishly to conceal it. End quote. So Phillips wrote in a deleted tweet... In an odd twist, the Times had gone from publishing state secrets to helping the government conceal them, end quote. And what they're really talking about here is the fact that the New York Times aided in posting or getting the information from the Pentagon Papers out there during the Vietnam War. And now, when somebody else is revealing state secrets, they're actually going and they're aiding the Pentagon and using their researchers and their journalists to identify him and track him down. And there is a weird, weird symbiotic relationship between the media and the government. And that's what they're really trying to highlight here. It's not necessarily just a problem with U.S. media. This happens with a lot of different media around the world. The government has very privileged access to certain types of information, of course, and they can declassify or classify whatever material they want. So if they want to give the New York Times a scoop and leak information on purpose, 
then they can say, hey, okay, Mr. Phillips, you know, we have worked with you in the past. We know you're a good writer. We know that you're a loyal American. We're going to give you the scoop on something. And then Mr. Phillips is like, oh, great. Thank you, Pentagon. That's so kind of you. I'll take it back. I'll write it up. I'll make sure that I'm really diligent. And then I'll send you a copy before we post it to make sure nothing too crazy gets out there. So there's this weird back and forth. It helps the government get information out there and really frame a certain narrative. And it helps the writers and the journalists and even the paper sell issues. But then it becomes dangerous when the fourth estate is really supposed to be a check. So the publishers, the journalists, they're supposed to be a check on the government. And let's be clear, Phillips here is acknowledging that. He's saying that if the New York Times was leaking this information, they would be trying to protect Texera rather than trying to basically indict him. Or eh, indict him is a legal term. Instead of actually trying to you know, track him down and find him, they would be protecting him. So it's a very interesting relationship that we're seeing playing out here. And I'm not just the one accusing. I'm not just saying, hey, okay, we know that they work together. This comes from Pentagon officials. Quote, there are similarities between the Pentagon Papers and Texera's leaks. While it's debatable whether these leaks put national security for Ukraine security at risk, it's clear that they are an embarrassment for the government officials. The documents suggest that the Ukraine forces are in more dire straits than our, their government has acknowledged publicly, the New York Times admits. The Associated Press, meanwhile, notes that, quote, at least one of the documents shows estimates of Russian troops' deaths in Ukraine that are significantly lower than the number publicly stated by the U.S. officials. Under a section titled, quote, Total Assessed Losses, one document lists 16 to 17,000 Russian casualties and up to 71,000 Ukrainian casualties. Quote, this is a very different picture than what Americans have been told by the military officials. Former CIA officials like Frank Snepp have publicly discussed how the agency plants stories with journalists to shape public opinion. In return for planting stories, journalists are often given access to documents, tips, and exclusives. These are the gatekeepers. Jack Texera and Julian Assange are the gate crashers. End quote. So what they mean by the gate crashers? Obviously, you may have some idea. It's the people that are not sanctioned by the government to leak certain things, to frame the narrative. You look at Julian Assange, you look at Texera, you look at Snowden, and even Snowden's a, a different case because he actually was the leaker rather than the person reporting the leaks. And Texera is also a, another weird case. But if you look specifically at Julian Assange, he's not the one going in and cracking this information from the vault. He's not the one that's hacking these different computers in order to get this information. He is actually obtaining it from somebody else and publishing it on WikiLeaks. So you can see this weird symbiotic relationship between the government and the media and how it's become stronger and stronger over time because people want access to this information. They want that career starting story. They want that story that is going to lift them up to the new heights that may get them that Pulitzer Prize. And if they shun the government, if they piss off different government officials, then they may not get access to that story. So it's really, really sad to see that the New York Times, who posted the Pentagon Papers, who was trying to keep the U.S. government liable during the Vietnam War, and has done so since. I'm not saying that they still don't do the job that they're supposed to do, which is be a check on the government. But it's sad to see even their top some of their top journalists, like Phillips, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, making a statement that's actually very true and then having to walk it back a little bit and say, okay, well, my, my tweet, it lacked a little bit of nuance. Okay, yeah, it may have lacked a little bit of nuance, but that doesn't mean that it's not true. And it doesn't mean that your relationship with the government is not dangerous to some degree. We do not need them partnering up against the public. Because at the end of the day, it becomes a very elite mentality. What happens when the government and the newspapers both say, oh, we know what information needs to get out to the people. We are the gatekeepers. We know what's best. We know how to frame the narrative. That is extremely dangerous, and it's an elite mentality that should not be acceptable. It's, it's a mentality that says, like I said, we know 
what is going to be the best for our nation. And we need to make sure that the people get this information and not this other type of information. Rather than trying to get as much of it out there as they can and letting the people make up their mind, they are actively crafting the narrative, therefore crafting the direction that this country goes and people's public opinion. And it's kind of just like the AI. It's very subtle. A lot of people, I think Tucker said this in his tweet, he said people think that they're actually debating serious issues. They think that when they go on Twitter and they're going back and forth about what they saw on Fox News or MSNBC, that they're actually having a debate. And they're actually going forward and testing these ideas and really combating the important issues. But then remember, where did you get that information from? Where did you get those talking points? Where did that idea come from? It came from the media. It came from MSNBC. It came from Fox News. They are setting the tone. They set the narrative. And we just decide to debate about the issues that they put forward. So... It's extremely scary to see, be an independent thinker, and make sure that when you can, challenge the people that want to directly control the narrative. Not in a dangerous way. I'm not saying go out and be a leaker. I'm not saying go and break into the Pentagon and get certain papers out of there. But I'm saying be diligent and make sure that to some degree you're playing a little bit of devil's advocate when it comes to the relationship between the government and the press and even just play devil's advocate to the government and try to keep them liable. And if you're doing this online, if you're doing it as an independent media outlet or something like that, I don't know, first off, if you are doing that, you're probably not listening to this podcast. But if you are, or if you're aspiring and you want to go out there and do that, just make sure that you don't get too caught up. If you ever get big enough that you're getting scoops from the government, really analyze what's going on and how you have gotten to this point. And is it actually going to help the people or are you just helping the government deceive the people? All right, let's jump to this last article. This one comes from the New York Post. Height, weight, discrimination bill, a fat gift to NYC's bottom feeding legal sharks. So I'm just going to jump straight into what the bill actually says. Quote, New York City is a paradise for employment lawyers. Witness the latest move by the city council to add yet another protected class to our already overstuffed roles on employment and business discrimination. Fat people. The body passed a bill that went into effect on Thursday with an overwhelming majority. It now awaits a signature from Mayor Adams. The bill offers the same protections against height discrimination. No word on whether this will apply to dating apps. Sorry, short kings. End quote. So what's really interesting about this, and there's been a push to end fat discrimination, has been a push to end the, how do they say it, the fat phobia that is ever present in our nation. And for the height discrimination, I can understand that. I think there's a a valid argument to some degree there because height is something that you can't necessarily control. A lot of it is genetically determined. I guess technically you could chop off your feet to be shorter if you felt like you were a short person in a tall person's body. But that's not necessarily as direct as your weight. Your weight is not necessarily, except in maybe a few small cases where people have a gland issue or a hormone issue, weight is not a characteristic that is directly inherent to you. Maybe you're a person who's predisposed to be a little bit heavier. Maybe your family doesn't have a great metabolism, but you can still choose to be healthier. You can choose to not eat that donut. You can choose to eat a salad. And of course, you can choose to eat that donut. And if you choose to eat that donut, maybe you're going to have to work a little bit harder the next week to cut those calories and to really lose that weight, especially as you get older and your metabolism isn't necessarily as perfect or as amazing as it was in your 20s. You may have to work a little bit harder in order to have those subtle joys, but you can still change your body weight. You can actively seek to be healthier and to be better off. So when they make being fat a protected class, it kind of irritates me a little bit because the idea of a protected class at least initially presented in the Civil Rights Act, was that these are certain characteristics that are inherent to you. Gender, sex, sorry, basically the same thing, but they did expand it to gender later on in our lifetimes. 
but race. These are things that you can't necessarily control. You come out of the womb a certain sex. You come out of the womb with a certain pigmentation in your skin. You can't change this, so therefore you should not be discriminated against for it. But when it comes to being fat, you can definitely change that. It may be really, really hard. It may be one of the hardest things that you have done in your life, but you can strive to be better and healthier. So making it a protected class is basically endorsing it. And this is coming from New York, the city that put higher taxes, sorry, the state, but mainly New York City, that put higher taxes on sugar, that tried to get rid of large size soda found drinks. And now they're saying that weight's a protected class. They're saying that you can be as fat as you want and you can't be discriminated because of it. What happens if your boss tells you to go behind the oven and repair it and you can't slip behind it because you're too large? Are they going to say, oh, no, well, you know, I can't do it. I'm a protected class and you can't fire somebody who's a repairman who needs to get into small places because they're too large. So it's just a real question of where America is headed. Are we going to protect people's bad decisions or are we going to protect inherent characteristics that they can't change? Are we going to endorse an unhealthy lifestyle, especially as we move towards a Medicare for all system? That really does scare me. I'm not going to lie. If we get to the point where we have a Medicare for all system and we still have this stupid debate over fat phobia and endorsing unhealthy lifestyles, then everybody who is healthy is going to be paying the bills of the people who are unhealthy, who are living off the government teat, and they are using that Medicare for all system. And then our tax dollars are going to go to those people who are eating five Big Macs a day and who don't care about their health. That's a problem that I actually was listening to in a different video the other day about why a, a public health care system may not work as well in the United States. Because in those European countries that are always looked to as the example of how a Medicare for all system may actually work, uh, the government actually has to come down really hard on different types of food, whether it be how they're processed, the amount of sugar in them, different drinks, because at that point, the government is actually, they're more involved in your lives because they are subsidizing the healthcare system. Therefore, they have a vested interest in ensuring that their population is healthy. And in America, we do not necessarily have a healthy population. Now, some people are healthy and we are slowly moving towards a more healthy society, but a large majority of Americans are not healthy. And that's why I think a Medicare for all system may not actually work as ideally as some people say, especially when we have bills like this coming out in New York, like I said, endorsing people's bad behavior, protecting their bad decisions, rather than saying, hey, no, 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 no. We're going to protect the things that you can't change about yourself, and we're not going to endorse your bad decisions that you could very well change if you chose to do so. All right, that's enough negative talk. Let's jump to our daily delight. This one comes from Travel and Leisure. This baby orangutan was just born at a California zoo. So it's a Sumatran or Sumatran orangutan, and this species is, you know, it's on the edge of extinction. So welcoming a new one into this world, you know, it's always a happy occasion. Quote, the baby boy was born for the first time to Mother Inoda in Sacramento Zoo on May 1st, according to the zoo. Both the baby and the mother were healthy and well and being cared for behind the scenes away from the public, end quote. And since his first birthday, this zoo, it's actually the first one that they've had in a long time, he's actually getting all the attention because of it. Quote, the baby is currently receiving around-the-clock care by animal care and veterinary staff while the team is continuously reevaluating plans to reunite the infant infant with his mother in da and the zoo posted this on their website and if you want to see any of the cute photos or videos from this article or you want to read any of the other articles you can find a link in the description below the like and subscribe button also down there you can find the podcast on Spotify Google Podcasts Podvine as well as What's the other one that I am missing off the top of my head? Ah, Pocket Cast. And we are on Twitter at Your Daily Flip, where you can find links to the video directly on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And also, within the next few days, I'm going to be porting over all the videos, including all the ones from episode number one to this one, 
over to Rumble. So you can go watch them on that if you want to. I'm not saying that YouTube's going to censor anything. We are not even close to big enough or even close to being on their radar that they would care about us. But having alternatives is an option. And at this point, I don't think I will pay for Twitter Blue. I didn't get any feedback on it. I actually sat on it, thought about it a little bit. I don't think I'll pay for Twitter Blue in order to upload them to Twitter. But if things change and if this new CEO is really killing it and she's bringing in lots of people and she's really allowing the company to thrive, then maybe we will be on pres present on Twitter at some point in the future as well. All right, with all that promotional stuff out of the way, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.